coming up this week. Free entry into London's best buildings, some a little unusual. The vanishing language on the Faroe Islands. Seeing the Deep South by car and the Black Forest by train. And the Scottish Porridge Wars. It's purists versus hipsters in the land of milk and honey. No prizes for guessing where I am this week. London has some of Europe's most recognisable architecture, even when it's covered in scaffolding. Each year, many of the capital's most magnificent buildings open their doors to the public for the annual open house. 2018 is their biggest event yet, with over 800 venues to explore. And I've come to Fitzrovia to visit one of this year's most striking openings. From the top of this tower of technology, you'll get the best view of London there's ever been. The BT Tower was opened in 1965, and for over a decade, it was London's tallest building. Standing at more than 600 feet, it was built to carry telecommunications all across the UK. And in true 60s fashion, the top doubled as a revolving restaurant. When you eat here, they give you a certificate of orbit to say you've been above and around the houses two and a half times in every hour. It's actually been closed since the 1980s, so the open house weekend is one of the only times that the likes of you or I are allowed in. Access to the tower is in high demand. Today's visitors have had to enter an online ballot to get a place. It's not that often you get this high up over London, but the view is incredible. And there are really famous landmarks you can see from here. We've got the Shah, the London Eye, British Museum here. It's kind of amazing and a bit of a shame that this isn't available all year round. This year's Open House is the biggest we've ever done. It's only the second time ever that we've had every London borough participate. Last year we also managed to have every London borough participate. That was for our 25th anniversary. And we've managed it again, which is a real achievement. So what were the origins of this idea? So the first Open House was literally a bus tour for about 100 people, enthusiasts who wanted to see contemporary architecture. And it was so popular, it was so oversubscribed, that the following year, um, a number of London boroughs participated and opened their doors. And today, in 2018, we expect a quarter of a million people, even despite the weather. So tell me, what are your top tips for getting the best out of an open house weekend? Top tips, absolutely, is maybe focus on the outer boroughs. You know, London has some amazing secrets tucked away just on the fringes of the city. You don't always have to go into the centre. The other tip I would give is pick one borough and just concentrate on that. There's always magic on your doorstep. All of the venues are listed on this handy app with maps. And it's not just the big venues you can go to visit. You can see inside people's private homes too. It's amazing that this house is sitting in the middle of a suburban street. Kind of an amazing feat of imagination made real. Impressive. This project sits within a much larger debate about the value of architecture. It seems to me there is a responsibility that each new building that is built or each new environment that is made must be better than the preceding one. And if this can encourage people to do that, then I think that is really valuable. Meanwhile, this is also on the list. 
I'm headed into the bowels of Queen Mary Hospital to the UCL Pathology Museum. It's a bit of a maze in here, sort of endless corridors. Hopefully I'm heading in the right direction. It's one of the very first chances for the public to see inside. I mean, it, it is fascinating, but it's not really for the faint heart of this. Sabhadra Das is the curator here and has been captivating visitors with stories about some of the specimens. I think we should start with probably the most iconic uh, specimen in the museum, and this is the famous sword swallower's sword and uh, esophagus and heart. What? Can you yeah. explain to me the logistics of this? So this is your ultimate um, health and safety failure at work scenario. <laughs> So what we can see here is this person's uh, food pipe and if you can see there's a little bit of plastic going down here and that's showing where the sword went in and tore through the esophagus and then hit the heart. This person's heart was beating at the time. So if you can imagine the heart beating, the heart beating against the sword is what pierces the heart itself. My goodness me. And what else do we have here? We've got, shall we move on to this one over here? We're still, it's still kind of all the fun of the fairground here. So <laughs> these are tattoos from a man who was, unsurprisingly, a tattooed man in a circus. That was how he made his living. Everything apart from the palms of his hands, the soles of his feet, and everything from the neck up, uh, the rest of him was completely covered in ink. Completely covered, of yeah. which these are this several is a selection. of his. I mean, yeah. his skin is preserved here. Absolutely. And it's quite remarkably well preserved. Yes, it I, mean, is, I think yeah. you could probably expect to see that kind of tattoo on somebody's arm. Easily. Today. Well, I think that one's really attractive. I really like, Whoever it was liked flying things. So we've got butterflies on one side, and then we've got a flying fish, and there's a fly there as well. Now, this surely can't be real. Well, this, this can't be to scale. Uh, well, no, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a scale of one to one. It's not a real hand, as you been able to guess. Well done, you've learned from being in here, very good. Uh, this is a plaster cast of a hand and we can see just about what's left of the painted label on, on the cast and it tells us it's the hand of a man who had a condition called acromegaly and that he was eight foot nine inches tall. And for me this is really interesting because acromegaly is the condition of one of the most famous bodies in any medical museum in the country, uh, which is the body of a man called Charles Byrne, the Irish giant, and that's preserved at the Royal College of Surgeons. So we haven't got him, but I do feel the need to point out that this gentleman was at least a foot taller. I suppose with kind of macabre objects like this, there's a possibility an exhibition like this could become almost a sideshow in itself. How do you stop that happening? I mean, people, people will think what they think, so I, I'm not gonna control what people's reactions to or ways of thinking about this are. I think that, that it is a gift that we have them, and I want to be able to share it with a wider audience, hopefully in a way that is respectful to the people involved. Well, next up, we're off to the remote Faroe Islands, an archipelago of 18 volcanic islands in the Atlantic Ocean, where locals are doing what they can to keep their native tongue alive. I think uh, one of the reasons why our language is still alive is simply because they were so locked down for a long, long period. But our own language was very much tied into the way they lived. So each and every bit of a boat has its distinct name and each tool has its name and each walk path and Everything had, had its name tied into the old fairy's language. And if they lost that, they would probably lose the ability to live here as well. For 700 years ago, this dance was in all Europe. But here in our uh, country, 
far away in the Atlantic Sea. So we still uh, was using uh, this chain dance, these stories, these melodies uh, as a part of our culture. And uh, our language has lived through these stories that have been told from, pe from generation to generation. Now we have around 17,000 verses. Um, and I think that's a lot because we shall remember that it was only 5,000 people on this island at that time. It's been verses that they have been remembered in their heads. You see, we fairies are a bit puristic, so we like to have our own words, like, like Icelanders. And fairies and Icelandic are closely related. We came both out from Norway. We settled here and Icelander settled there. We think, why should all we all take the English words for all? We all make something ourselves. I speculated, what should we call computer? Tell is a number. So Telda. Everybody call it Telda. Computer. <laughs> so. When we were kids, we were always thinking they sounded a bit weird. But nowadays you think it's weird if anybody says helicopter or if anybody says computer instead of uh, Delta and such. Still to come on The Travel Show. Seeing the Deep South by car and the Black Forest by train. And the Scottish Porridge Wars, its purists versus hipsters in the land of milk and honey. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions for getting the best out of travel. Coming up, the gift of a weekend in Italy and directions for a road trip in America's deep south. First though, October marks the official opening of the QE2 as a floating hotel in Dubai. Since she first set sail nearly half a century ago, the Queen Elizabeth II has circled the globe 25 times. For the past decade, she's been languishing at Port Rashid in Dubai after several false starts to refit her. Finally, the work is done and she is welcoming guests on board once again. Next, Christine Evans has a lovely idea to celebrate her son's 50th birthday later this year. She says he's never been to Italy and she wonders... Can we buy a weekend trip as a gift? For example, a flight voucher from Britain to Venice or Rome, and maybe three nights in a hotel on dates he chooses? Christine, a number of airlines sell gift vouchers, but I'm not in favour of them because they restrict the flights you can take. Similarly, hotel chains sell gift cards, but again, you're restricting choice. Instead, I suggest you find a friendly travel agent. Ask them to write a letter to your son saying you have a weekend in the Italian city of your choice. You can set a budget if you want, maybe £500, and once he's chosen the dates and the flights, the travel agent can then work out the best place to stay. Peter Freeman is off to New Orleans and he's keen to add on a few days driving through the states of Louisiana and Mississippi. Where would you suggest we aim for in those states? Louisiana and Mississippi are big states. Together they're larger than the UK, so pick a few highlights. Head west from New Orleans along the river road which winds beside the Mississippi. Go into the bayou a Native American word meaning tranquil waters. Take a boat trip, keeping a close eye open for alligators. Visit the quintessential Greek revival plantation house of Oak Alley. Then continue upstream. 
The Mississippi forms the state border between Louisiana and the state of Mississippi, where the highlight is the town of Natchez, founded in 1790 by the Spanish. It claims to be the home of the friendliest folks you'll ever meet, and it also tells the story of the Deep South from the perspective of slaves and Native Americans. In October, Robert Boston is heading for Lake Constance, which is surrounded by Austria, Germany and Switzerland. He wants to know... Now, what's the best way to get there from London and where should we stay? You could fly to Friedrichshafen in Germany or to the largest Swiss city, Zurich, but I recommend the rail trip. It's far more rewarding. Go via Paris and Strasbourg to the German town of Offenberg, which is where the beautiful line across the Black Forest to Lake Constance begins. I suggest you stay in the pretty town of Lindau in Germany, just beside the Austrian border. Even in October, you should be able to dine al fresco on the elegant main boulevard. If you want to get your travel plans in order, I'm here to help. Just email the travel show at bbc.co.uk and I'll do my very best to find you an answer. From me, Simon Calder, the global guru, bye for now and see you next time. We're finishing this week in Scotland and with the very best porridge the world has to offer. The Oscars of the Oat World, the Golden Spurtles, have just been handed out. The main prize was won jointly by a pair of Swedes, Kelly Meisel and Per Carlsen. But there hasn't been a local winner since 2014. So is the country losing its taste for its own national breakfast? We sent Rajan to Edinburgh to find out. People come to Edinburgh for the history largely, the drama of the castle or the grandeur of Holyrood House. But we've come here for the food. Haggis, porridge, deep fried Mars bar. All absolutely delicious in their own right, of course. But in recent years, it's how you eat your porridge that's taken on an importance all of its own. Purists would always tell you that the only properly Scottish way to eat porridge was with a little salt and water. Trouble is, it's just not that nice, is it? And these days, if you ask most Scots, they'll tell you they like jazzing it up a bit. What do you, what do you have in it? Fruit. And, fruit and milk. Ah. And that's all. I quite like putting dark sugar on it. I like it with treacle and milk. <laughs> I do. Honestly, you make an island, but it's got to be the traditional porridge. None okay. of this English rubbish. And how do you have your porridge? Um, with salt. Well, I'm Scottish, you see. You've got to have it with porridge. In the age of social media, all that grey gloop just isn't Instagrammable enough. But there's one place here in the student team Marchmont district that's looking to restore this country's reputation for total porridge supremacy. Can I try a peach melba Absolutely, porridge, Absolutely, sure, no yeah? problem. OK. Elaine opened Edinburgh's first porridge cafe a few years ago now. Traditionalists would be appalled by this very 21st century twist on their national dish. Isn't this sacrilege? Because porridge should be simple, water, salt, oats. No, absolutely not. I think um, this is preserving porridge for the next generation. I think there's a bit of a porridge movement and there's a porridge cafe in New York, there's one in Copenhagen, there's one in London. I think we are the first one in, in Scotland, I think, if not definitely Edinburgh. Can I try it? Yes, please. For the hardcore oat fan, there are plenty of opportunities to sample the very best, which led the tourist board to create bespoke porridge tours, taking you all over the country. And luckily, one of the key stops is only an hour's train ride outside Edinburgh. Now, Ochtimurthy may look like a small, unassuming, nice little Scottish town, but what it has got is the king of porridge. 
Neil Robertson, the only man to hold two Golden Spurtle Awards, runs this traditional tea room. And it's where you come if you're after real salt and water porridge with absolutely no adornment. So this is the, the Puritan's porridge. And actually, you have to order ahead for this because it takes six hours for the oats to soak before they're ready. But let's uh, give it a go. Yep, it's kind of what you expect. It's um, it's it's edible. It's it's quite bland. You can the the texture is is definitely quite quite nutty. Um, and I could certainly eat a whole bowl of this, and it's supposed to be very good for you. However, I've also ordered some of Neil's slightly sweeter porridge, made of toasted spices, creme fraiche, and blueberry compote, which won him his second award back in 2010. I thought it would just be a fun day out cooking porridge in a village hall. I was amazed it is actually an international competition. Um, and I won, back, won the title back from America, believe it or not. Uh, being such a big story, I thought I should commemorate the event by um, having it tattooed. Wow, so you got tattooed. Go look at this. In Scotland, the traditional Puritan porridge is the one that everyone swears by, and it goes back a long time. It's actually dying out, is that right? Yes, it is, sadly. Um, people seem to be in such a hurry in the mornings that they don't fit it into the day. A lot of people just want to grab and go, so they eat the instant porridge, a very quick porridge, um, which is a bit of a shame, um, but I can understand it. Right, you're ready to taste some of this? Oh, yeah, certainly yeah, yeah, right, I certainly am. If you want to help yourself to a spoon there, it will be hot. Mmm. Mmm. And they go well together. Yeah. They go really well together. You might call me a bit of a softy, but I've got to be honest with you, this is far, far nicer. And yeah, I could have this regularly. I think I will. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for on this week's show. But coming up next week... Carmen will be travelling around Taiwan. She'll be sampling the acoustics of a brand new concert hall in Kaohsiung. Learning how to pick tea in the hills of Alishan and making a wish while releasing a sky lantern at a traditional festival in Pingxi. So do join us then. But in the meantime, don't forget, you can keep up with us while we're out on the road in real time if you sign up to our social media feeds. But for now, from me, Crystal Larwood, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>